Hidden deep in the midst of all of this is those things you can put like on 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 the things that trick Chat GPT. Like you'll ask a thing in an assignment, and Chat GPT will like invent a thing that it's not supposed to to try to answer it. it it's a way to call out and let people know you can tell if people are are using AI to do stuff and they're supposed to be doing it their own way. So, okay. What do we think happens to our cardiovascular parameters during exercise? Okay. Zach, what did y'all put for cardiac output? Increases. Anybody else? Anybody disagree? Anybody disagree? You all think cardiac output goes up? Are you sure? Okay. Fine. You're right. You're right. Did I convince you all that the sky is not blue, do you think? Can I, can I talk y'all into that? Are you sure? I think it's the same blue for every one of you. You think blue? How do you know blue is blue? It's too early. It's <laughs> in the philosophy too much. Okay, fine. All right. Uh, we'll pick a different a different group. Jenna, what'd y'all put for heart rate? Increases. If cardiac output goes up, does heart rate have to go up? Yeah, yeah it does. Okay. Um, who wants to do stroke volume? Anybody? Stroke volume? Increase. Would it have to increase? Why would it have to increase? But what if only heart rate goes up and stroke volume stays the same? Is cardiac output still going to go up? What? I mean, algebra? <laughs> cardiac output <laughs> equals heart rate times stroke volume. If this one goes up, then that one has to go up. This could stay the same, and this it would just be this. Okay. I'm not suggesting that's what happens. I'm just saying that mathematically, right, that's a possibility in those ways. Okay. Now, I could make that. I could do something to make that happen. If you guys wanted me to. But what happens? What happens to stroke volume? It goes up. Okay. It does go up. But then it does a weird thing. And it goes down. <laughs> I, uh, it goes up for a little while and then it sort of flattens out. And maybe at very high intensities, it will go down because heart rate gets really, really high. But it goes up. Okay. And then it plateaus off. Okay, what about blood pressure? Should I have been more specific about blood pressure? Yeah. yeah. So we talk about. Systolic pressure and diastolic pressure. We split them like that. And then what y'all put? What happens to blood pressure? Increases. You wanna do you think do they both increase? Yeah. Systolic goes up. What about diastolic? You better stay the same, or you're all about to die. Okay. Going down is okay, but it better stay the same, or we need to call the ambulance. Okay. One of the surest things, if anybody's ever on a treadmill or on a bike and they're exercising and you're monitoring their blood pressure, which I don't often, we don't often do that, but it's like if it, if diastolic pressure starts rising during exercise, bad things are happening. Bad, bad things. Okay. What about blood distribution? No, what you and Derek put? What about where's, where's the blood go? Yes. From where? Where where is it not? Okay, that's a terrible sentence. Where is it at rest? And then where's it gonna come from to go to the, the skeletal muscle? Yeah. The digestive system. Move the skeletal muscle. Okay. Good. Good. All right. Now, who's got the who's got the worst thing possible for us to do to try to evoke these changes in someone else? Try to do heavy squats. Heavy squats. And okay. Joey wants to do heavy squats. Should we make him do heavy squats? Yeah. yeah. That that no. He's on you. Everybody get like three backpacks and we'll throw them on him and, and here we go. No. Okay. 
Do we think that would work? Would heavy squats make all those go up? Anybody got anything else? Running, walking, jogging, weightlifting, doesn't matter. Cardiovascular response is the same. Why though? Why is it this? Why is this what happens? I know you all hate it when I ask you why. Very good. Why do I need more oxygen? I need more oxygen because I'm doing, we'll just say metabolism. Why do I need more? Excuse me. Why do I need more metabolism? <laughs> Why do I need more ATP? Good. Okay. I need force production. Okay. So again, I want you guys to try to understand that all of the things we've talked about in class up until now are linked together. Okay. We spent all of that time talking about how muscles work and how they generate force because that determines what our ATP demand is. And our ATP demand partially determines that we need how much more oxygen we need, which then drives all of these changes right in the cardiovascular system to help us meet this demand. Okay. So let's do another thought experiment. Okay, how much ATP do I need when I'm walking versus if I'm running? More, less, the same? A little, a lot. A little and a lot, okay? So what would we imagine then that the cardiovascular responses are going to be to walking versus running? Correlated. Yes, they are correlated. That's right. But you're going to get less of a response, right? Less of a change during walk than you're going to get during jog. You're going to get less of an increase in heart rate, maybe less of an increase in stroke volume, less of an increase in blood pressure, less, maybe not less blood flow. Okay. But again, the intensity of exercise. The amount of muscle that has to generate force, the amount of force it generates, determines the ATP cost, which then is going to help us determine the cardiovascular response to that kind of exercise. This is why we can use heart rate or cardiac output or even mildly a change in blood pressure as a surrogate for exercise intensity. This is why you can monitor your heart rate and know where am I on that spectrum, basically, of how difficult it is for me to exercise? And you can use heart rate to prescribe things because the heart rate response is linked to the metabolic response, which is linked to the force demands on our muscles. Okay? All of this is inextricably linked in some way. Okay? And... We'll walk through a little bit about what this looks like, and I'll give you guys some funky scenarios that any of you that want to work in OT or PT or anything else will encounter that will screw these relationships up. Okay. All right. Questions so far. I will not make you guys do your terrible exercise things. Okay. All right. Okay. So, remember, cardiac output response, right, as it increases during exercise, it is going to increase in a very, very linear manner <laughs> with oxygen consumption, okay? Of all of our variables, and we'll pick this up on like the very last slide, of all of our variables that we can graph or that we can look at that look like and respond very similar to oxygen consumption, cardiac output's the one that is the most closely related, okay? Whoever in here has the highest or the largest cardiac output per your body size will have the highest VO2 max, okay? It's very, very, very simple in some ways. 
Why does cardiac output go up? Because both heart rate and stroke volume go up, okay? So therefore it is a mathematical certainty. Um, what we're gonna see though, as we move along is that once we clear 40 to maybe 60% of max heart rate or max oxygen consumption, all of the increase in cardiac output is from heart rate. Stroke volume goes up and then it levels off. And so early on at low intensity exercise, you're gonna get an increase in both, but at high, it's all about heart rate, okay? It's all about heart rate. So we'll, we'll get into a little bit of the whys of that in a second, okay? But that's the big deal. Cardiac output looks like this, okay? Here's treadmill speed, which is gonna be our surrogate for like intensity or oxygen consumption demands. Again, as speed goes up, force production goes up, we can work our way backwards here. So there's this relatively linear increase in cardiac output. <clears throat> How would I measure your cardiac output? How would I know how much blood we are pumping out of the left ventricle in a minute? Heart rate monitor? Heart rate monitor? Heart rate monitor would tell me your heart rate, but how am I going to get to liters of blood? To probe the aorta or something? To probe the aorta, right? Okay. It's a fun word on the day after Halloween, right? It evokes horror movie types of things. But you can run a central line. So you could put a catheter into the aorta, okay? And then we can put a, a flow meter in there and measure it that way. We can also estimate it probably using ultrasound. You could do an echocardiogram and you could put the ultrasound on and you can measure blood flow coming out of the, the aorta, doing all of that. And we can try to estimate it that way. <laughs> Another way that's really terrible, but you, you breathe into a giant balloon and you rebreathe carbon dioxide. And we watch the changes as you rebreathe carbon dioxide and O2 consumption and some things, and we can use to estimate this. It's called CO2 rebreathing. It's an old, an old school way of doing things. It's terrible because you're breathing air that has less oxygen in it. So you feel like you can't like ever catch your breath with those kinds of things. So the things we do for science. Okay, that's cardiac output. Okay. As I mentioned the other day, most of you are about four to five or six liters per minute at rest. And you're going to be able to increase about five times, five or six times, 20. And then our elite elite athletes, we're going to get up, they're going to get up into the, the low to mid 30s in liters per minute. Probably the biggest increase, especially during high intensity exercise, is your heart rate. And we're going to get that cardiac output response by raising the heart rate, by removing vagal input, and then adding synthetic input. Stroke volume goes up to a point. Stroke volume goes up because preload goes up, and we're going to get an increase in contractility, and we're going to get vasodilation to our skeletal muscles. Which is going to be okay. Right. So it's a combination of these, and we'll take each one of these in in turn here as we as we go along. Okay, but that's the big that's the big take home. Okay, here is heart rate versus exercise intensity. It's the same x-axis as the other ones. It's treadmill speed. Then you've got heart rate, very, very linear. Okay, this is why heart rate is such a useful estimate of exercise intensity. This is why this is the thing that we tend to use. Okay, especially if you've got a good monitor and it's like a chest strap versus whatever you're getting from your Apple Watch or something. Um, might be the Apple Watch may be a little bit wonky, although it's usually pretty good. It beats most. Okay, and so once we get out, kind of out here at the top end. All of our cardiac output increases due to this, due to this sort of top end increase in heart rate. Okay. As heart rate increases, okay, as heart rate increases, the time from heartbeat to heartbeat shrinks. So the cardiac cycle time shrinks. And so here in the top portion of this graph, it's showing a resting cardiac cycle that's about 0.8 seconds. That's about 75 beats per minute. And then it shows the relative proportions of systole and diastole, about a third of a second versus half of a second. So diastole 
it's going to be the majority of the cardiac cycle, which is good. When the left ventricle or anything is relaxed, it's easier for blood to flow in and to fill up. But when you're doing heavy exercise, here's 180 beats per minute, okay? And the cardiac cycle is only about a third of a second. And you'll note in this one, then now systole is predominating over diastole. So our filling time is shrinking, our contraction time is shrinking. And it's this, why this thing here, when diastole falls so much, it's going to have an impact at very high heart rates on stroke volume. Okay. Okay. So as I said, and I'll just show you guys what the graph looks like, what the graph looks like first. Okay. Stroke volume climbs. We get to basically a jog or maybe even a slightly brisk jog in most people. And then stroke volume doesn't go up anymore. Okay. And stroke volume doesn't go up anymore. And yet, in people that are the same, close to the same age, whatever your stroke volume plateaus off at right about here, that's the primary thing that determines cardiac output. Max, it's the primary thing that determines VO2 max from a cardiovascular perspective. Okay. So what we need to try to understand though is why does stroke volume plateau? Okay. Why does it plateau? And to understand why it plateaus, we also have to understand what makes it go up in the first place. And then is that are those parameters going to stop being able to increase? And the answer, of course, is yes, they will. Okay. All right. So everybody can increase cardiac and can increase heart rate up to a certain point. Cardiac output is the product of these two things. And so if you're the same age and your max heart rate is the same, as I mentioned, whoever has the bigger stroke volume has the larger cardiac output. So in, in you guys, well, almost all of us, right, Stacy? In, in you guys that are all about the same age, whoever has the biggest stroke volume, it's going to have the highest cardiac output, right? So understanding kind of what's going into all of this is really important, okay? So why does stroke volume go up with exercise? Well, the first thing that happens, which is one of the most important things in determining stroke volume ever, even at rest, is preload, okay? It's preload or venous return. <clears throat> when you start exercising, you immediately start pushing more blood back into the heart, okay? This is primarily driven by the muscle pump, okay? So if I start doing squats, and they're not Joey's super heavy squats, but I'm doing squats, as I contract the muscles in my legs, I squeeze the veins in my legs, that shoves blood back towards my heart, increasing venous return, and immediately increases preload. Okay, that's further assisted by as cardiac output begins to rise, more blood is being forced out of the heart and around, which is then going to also drive more back. So we're getting an increase in preload here as you go from rest to light intensity to kind of moderate intensity activity. We're also going to get a drive and increase in stroke volume from increases in ventricular contractility. That comes from two places. One, as preload goes up through the branch starling mechanism, we stretch the left ventricle, we get a greater contractility. But we're also going to start adding, okay, sympathetic nervous system input onto the ventricle. Especially norepinephrine is going to drive an increase in the force of contraction of the heart. As it contracts more forcefully, it will eject more blood and stroke volume will go up. Finally, we are going to make afterload fall. By vasodilating out to skeletal muscle, we're going to make total peripheral resistance fall, which means it's easier for blood to get out and leave out of the heart, which means we can have greater emptying, so there will be less afterload. Okay, less afterload. So why does this stop? Okay. Why does all of this stop? It works up to a point and then it stops. Well, there's really two things that are happening. The first is going to be decreased filling time. 
as that cardiac cycle shrinks, diastole shrinks, and so it's going to put some limits on how much blood we can get in. So preload is going to plateau off, okay? And then we're going to max out contractility because preload can't go up anymore. We can't get any more contractility from French Starling. And we're also going to max out the ability of the sympathetic nervous system to raise contractility. The heart's only so big. It's only so strong. You're only going to get at some point whatever you're going to get. Okay. Your heart's doing a one rep max. That's all it's got. Okay. And so between these two things, this tends to plateau in most people somewhere at about you know 50 to 60 percent of your VO2 max. So somewhere in this sort of brisk, brisk walk to a jog out of intensity. Okay. So it's going to go off for the most part there. All right. Okay, we talked quite a bit about this on Wednesday. This is just a graphic depiction um, of where is the blood going, okay? And we have here heavy exercise on the top. So cardiac output of about 25 liters per minute. On the bottom, we've got resting cardiac output of about five liters per minute. And then you can see then in some ways based upon sort of where you're seeing the individual tissue, but you can see the numbers here along the bottom and the top trying to show us the percentage of that cardiac output that's going to various places. So you'll note, right, splenic regions about 20 to 25% at rest, almost nothing during exercise. So from 20 to 25% down to three to five, okay? You'll note that the, the amount of blood flow, the percentage going to the cardiac muscle is about 5%, no matter what, that doesn't change. Kidneys go from about 20% to about two to four, okay? We don't get a lot of blood flow to our bones anyway, but it goes down ever so slightly. The absolute blood flow to the brain is gonna be the same, but the percentage of cardiac output falls quite a bit. Skin, okay? Skin is gonna go up, skeletal muscle is gonna to tend to go up as well, okay? We are using our arterioles and controlling vasoconstriction and vasodilation to these individual tissues to direct our cardiac output where we want it to go. And the general take home very simply is we're going to send as much as we possibly can to skeletal muscle. Okay. We're going to keep the brain and the heart getting some, and then everything else is basically going to, going to go away. Okay. Everything else is going to go away. Okay, this is the same concept, but I, I like these different visuals in the graphs, okay? Um, and what you're seeing here is the same idea, but in the left graph, we are expressing sort of the percentage of cardiac output that is going to a particular tissue. And it's, it's always, there's always only 100%, right? So here's rest, right? 100% of cardiac output and rest of that 100%, right? You can see almost 60% is going to kidneys, liver, stomach, intestine. As we increase from to walking to jogging to maximal exercise, you'll note how the amount going to the splenic regions falls. This orange here is skeletal muscle. You'll note how it goes way, way up. And then green is heart, blue is brain, heart stays the same. Brain can go down a little bit. Um, we could have a fascinating, like an entire class about what happens to the brain and cognitive processes during exercise. And that there is this tipping point at which exercise intensity becomes high enough that you have to start shunting basically cognitive function towards exercise. And you can't do two tasks at once um, with everything. You guys have probably all had that experience. If you ever tried to exercise while thinking about studying or even having a conversation with a friend or something that at sort of low intensities, you can both exercise and think and do math and, and stuff like that. You can always talk, but you can, uh, to do that, when it gets high enough, you have to start sort of, one of them has to start suffering. So it's really kind of interesting. Here on the one on the right, it's the same graph, okay? It's the same concept. 
but it's showing the absolute amount of cardiac output. So here's rest at five liters per minute. Here's light exercise at about 12 and a half. Here's moderate at 20. Here's max at about 27 or 28, okay? And then within each one of these bars, the relative size of the colors is showing me what's happening in the left graph, right? So you can see a smaller cardiac output, mostly going to splenic regions. That's going to fall as we go up. And you can see again the big, big, giant increase in what goes to skeletal. That should be the big take -up. When you exercise, you can send all your blood to your skeletal muscle. Okay. That should be the really big take -up. Okay. Now, we talked about blood pressure a little bit the other day when we did their normal regulation. What you see in this graph on the top portion, okay, you've got red and green lines in both. Red is going to represent arm only exercise, green represents leg exercise. So, Riding a bike with your legs versus riding a bike with your arms. And then the bottom lines are diastolic pressure. The general take home with blood pressure is because contractility goes up, okay, systolic blood pressure goes up. Diastolic stays relatively the same. It may fall a little bit if we get total peripheral resistance to go, to go way down. But you get these differential responses based upon the amount of muscle mass that you're engaging in exercise. And it does the opposite of what you might think. The more muscle you use during exercise, the less of an increase in systolic blood pressure you're going to see relative to using a smaller amount of muscle mass. Okay. And so when you do cycling this with your arms, the systolic blood pressure increase will be greater than if you cycle just with your legs. And this is all about having less muscle active, less vasodilation to a larger percentage of muscle. So it keeps peripheral resistance higher. And so I show you guys all of this because we have a lot of rehabilitative situations where people can't use their legs and we have them do arm exercise, which is great. But if you have older people who are already prone to having high blood pressure and you have them do arm only exercise, or God forbid you have them do arm only resistance exercise and they're holding their breath and they're doing Valsalva and their blood pressure response is gonna go through the fucking roof. And that can be really, really dangerous in those ways. So if you guys ever see when they teach you things at PT and OT school, right? I'm not gonna ruin your, okay, well, the recovery modalities don't actually work. That's a whole class, right? But the other things that we're gonna do, just be aware of all of Okay. That that blood pressure response can be can be more pronounced during kind of small muscle mass or arm only exercise that you might think would be less taxing and safer. Okay. All right. There's another weird thing that happens, and that is when we exercise, we actually drive plasma out of our blood and into our muscles. Okay, out of our blood into our muscle. Hence the necessity of every Instagram reel from a gym ever. Okay. This is called hemoconcentration, and this is what gets us that pump during or after a bout of exercise. Okay. But what is happening is we may lose some plasma volume from sweating, but mostly what's going to happen is we're going to increase blood pressure and we're gonna increase ionic concentrations from metabolism in the muscles and it's gonna pull water out. And you might think that this is bad. As plasma volume falls, blood volume falls, which can have some effects on preload. But the hemoconcentration does a thing that offsets a little bit of this. Any, anybody? Anybody here from or ever from a place that's at, at higher altitudes? Anybody from Colorado or Utah or someplace? Okay. You ever notice, like, if you're here and you go home, like, for the summer, or you go home for a couple of weeks, um, you don't have to answer this, but, like, do you have to pee more all of a sudden right when you first go? Yeah. One of the responses, the same thing that helps one of the responses to going to altitude 
is you dehydrate yourself. And by dehydrating yourself, it lowers plasma volume. And so it makes your hematocrit percentage, the amount of your blood that is actually red blood cells as a percentage of total volume increase. Okay. Now that is offset by the fact that total blood volume falls, which is not great, but you hemoconcentrate. And so technically that makes you better at carrying oxygen in your blood than you were without the hemoconcentration. And so the same thing happens during a bout of exercise. You drive fluid or plasma out of your blood, artificially increasing your hematocrit percentage during exercise, which makes you more efficient at carrying oxygen per volume of blood. Okay. So it increases your O2 carrying capacity. So it's a fascinating thing. Again, in a couple of years, once you guys are gone, we'll we were gonna we're gonna offer a class at the undergraduate level on environmental exercise physiology, where we'll talk about what happens to exercise in the heat, what happens in the cold, what happens when you go to altitude, and all of these things. It's really, really fascinating um, on, on a bunch of that stuff. Okay. So, but the other cool thing is that this shift during exercise is part also of what stimulates. The aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone response that we talked about before after exercise. And so you exercise and hemoconcentrates. We don't like that. You release those hormones that make us retain salt and retain water at the kidney, which then raises our plasma volume back up. And that's one of the primary responses to exercise training is that you expand your plasma volume. Your blood volume goes up, which can then raise cardiac output. So it's all due to some of these kind of individualized changes that happen during everything. Okay. Okay. Very, very last concept. Okay. Something called arterial oxygen, arterial venous oxygen difference. Okay. This may not be the last math that we do in class, but it's going to be close. AVO2 difference is a way for us to quantify how much oxygen has been taken out of arterial blood in the capillaries, okay? And so we look at, there's X amount in an artery that goes to a tissue. There's some smaller amount in the veins leaving that tissue. The difference between those two numbers tells us how much left arterial blood in the capillary, okay? <laughs> it's a measure of what we call oxygen extraction, okay? Is that, does those terms at least make sense to you guys? Okay, those terms make sense? I can draw it out over here. There's arterial blood. There's venous blood, right? This is O2 content in the tube. And so this amount here is how much was extracted. So this is what AVO2 difference is a measure. Okay. The numbers behind this, the absolute numbers, you guys don't have to know. You know, it doesn't matter if you guys understand that it's six milliliters ish in most of us at rest. That's an unimportant number. Okay. What I want you all to know, basically, is that during exercise, arterial O2 content, as long as you have good lung function, stays constant, right? <laughs> Hemoglobin is always very, very saturated. It stays constant. But as exercise increases, you begin to pull more out. So that venous concentration falls. And so AVO2 difference gets bigger, okay? AVO2 difference gets bigger. You may say that's great, Dr. Black, but why again do we give a shit? Well, what it lets us do is it lets us do an algebraic equation where we can show the relationship between oxygen consumption at any exercise intensity or at rest and cardiac output and O2 extraction which is mostly a measure of capillaries and mitochondria 
that muscle that are going to derive. So this equation is called the thick equation. And I do want you guys to know that. You do have to memorize this. The thick equation tells us that oxygen consumption is equal to cardiac output multiplied by AVO2 difference. So how much blood goes to a muscle in a minute multiplied by how much oxygen is taken out of that blood will tell us then how much the muscles use. Okay. So VO2 is equal to heart rate multiplied by stroke volume multiplied by AVO2 difference. Okay. Multiplied by AVO2 difference. The cool thing about the thick equation is it lets us understand responses to training, responses if you're taking certain drugs, age, a whole bunch of things, okay, that may determine especially maximal oxygen consumption. Max VO2 is equal to max heart rate multiplied by max stroke volume multiplied by maximal AVO2 difference. So using the thick equation, why should my max heart rate drop because I'm older? I just gave it away, so I, I can't make this one either. Using the thick equation, you can understand why, because my max heart rate is lower, you guys have an advantage on me from a max VO2 standpoint, right? Because part of that equation, I can't, I'm, you know, 25 beats per minute. God, I'm getting old, less than you guys. Okay, less. That's like an eighth of our heart rate. I'm sorry, for some funny, but over the reserve, it's even more than that. Okay, why does someone who has a larger stroke volume get an advantage? You're all the same age, your max heart rate's the same. The bigger the stroke volume, the bigger your cardiac output, so your max VO2 can go up. Okay. And then we'll see when we add mitochondria and we add capillaries with, the, with endurance training, it can help us make the AVO2 difference portion go up. All right. I promise you on the test, I will give you things and make you use the thick equation and like predict who's going to have a higher VO2 or something. Okay. I took this morning because my doctors, because people are bad, my doctors will not prescribe me Xanax anymore. Most physicians won't. Benzodiazepines are amazingly addictive. They're amazingly addictive. And so I was like, well, can I get a rescue medicine for my anxiety if I have something? And they prescribe me something called propranolol. You know what propranolol is? It's a beta blocker. It is meant for... Like, I got to stand up in front of people, and I'm going to get real freaked out, and it's meant for, like, social anxiety, for presentation anxiety, and those kinds of things. And I'm like, well, I don't need this. Like, I'm, I'm not worried, like, that my heart is beating too fast or something. But I took a propranolol this morning because just, you know, reasons and all of this. And so I have now, by having a beta blocker on board, artificially prevented epinephrine and norepinephrine from allowing me to raise my heart rate and my stroke volume as much. It doesn't matter right now because I'm resting. But if I was to go and exercise right now, I would likely not be able to raise my heart rate to my age predicted max. And you guys would need to know that if you were trying to prescribe exercise. If you take caffeine, which most of you do, or I don't want to single out the men, but you know, how many of you guys have a Zen pouch or something in your bag right now? Our research tells us all of y'all, we can't find dudes that don't take nicotine, okay? Nicotine mimics sympathetic nervous system function. You'll get an exaggerated heart rate response during exercise. So it will be artificially high at a particular place. Okay. All right, good deal. We'll start pulmonary stuff on Monday. You guys have a good weekend. See ya.